to today's webinar, SDL Trillion Sites and the General Data Protection Regulation. My name's Kate and I'll be your host today. Our speakers today are Andrew Fisher, who's a Data Privacy Officer at SDL, and Alvin Reyes, who is the Technical Product Manager at SDL. We expect today's webinar to last around 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please add these into the Q&A box and we'll be sure to answer them at the end of the webinar. I'm now going to pass you over to Andrew, who's going to begin the presentation. Thank you, Kate. I am Andrew Fisher, and I am the Data Privacy Officer for the SDL Group. At SDL, we are very aware of the impact of the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, because we are both a data controller and a data processor. As a data controller, we process our own data. And as a data processor, we are instructed by our customers, you, to process your personal data or personal data which your company processes on behalf of your customers. And when we host our software for a customer, we are a data processor for GDPR purposes for the very limited processing which is providing the storage facility and related infrastructure even though we outsource aspects of this. When we simply license software to our customers, we are neither a data controller nor processor, as we are not involved in any data processing. But SDL recognizes that regardless of whether our customers are going to deploy our software products in their own environment or have the software hosted by SDL, the products themselves have to enable our customers to do business. So what this means is the products themselves have to provide SDL customers with a functionality to enable you to meet your obligations under the GDPR when you are processing personal data utilizing our products. This webinar will highlight to you what SDL has done to assist you in meeting these obligations. At a high level, these obligations fall into two broad areas. The ability to respond to the rights of the data subjects, which uh, is Article 15 to 22 of the GDPR for GDPR geeks. And the second area is ensuring that appropriate security is implemented as required by Article 32. So to explain these areas a little further, for the rights of the data subject, SDL provides you with the ability to uh, identify where personal data is being processed, rectify, delete, or erase that data, manage the extent of the data processing, and respond to requests for data portability. These Alvin will talk about in more detail. And turning to the second area, which is security, well, sadly, the need for security when processing personal data is apparent to all businesses, as we are all combating cybersecurity threats on a daily basis. The wider public is reading the news every couple of weeks, if not weekly, of a data breach. So GDPR requires the implementation of appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risk. And SDL addresses the security aspects relevant to us. So when developing software, we ensure we use secure software development in the development lifecycle. And where software is provided by us on a cloud basis or SDL provides hosting, we and our hosting providers provide the appropriate security to ensure the ongoing confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the personal data. So as SDL will be effective from the 25th of May of this year in about 60 days' time, we all need to be aware of what it requires. And although there's been much discussion about what it means in commentaries and blogs, there has been relatively little guidance from the official authorities to help us interpret the principles of the GDPR. At SDL, we will continue to study the guidance as it becomes available and will, um, where possible, incorporate into the development of our products the necessary functionality to enable ongoing compliance with GDPR. I will now hand you over to Alvin who is going to explain to you some of the features in SDL Trillion which already help you with GDPR compliance. 
Hello, my name is Alvin. I'm a product owner with SDL Treaty Insights. I'm originally from San Diego, but I've been in the Netherlands since 2015. I'm a, I'm a longtime brand advocate for Tridian. Uh, I've been a customer, uh, I was a customer in 2008, joined SDL as a functional consultant in 2011, and I have over a dozen years in IT, and I've had um, uh, several different research uh, projects around web technologies, including things like analytics, uh, SEO, accessibility, uh, application performance monitoring, privacy practices and regulations such as HIPAA, and now GDPR. Around 2013, a lot of the industry was talking about customer experience management, where you track and follow your customer across different, across different points, contact points. And one of the things that came up into my, my head and I, and I blogged about was the idea that if you do so, we should be responsible. That as part of your requirements for personalization, you should uh, be transparent and give users um, control over their data. Um, so, rule number one, at least from my perspective, and this is not in the GDPR, is don't be creepy. So this is our agenda. We're going to start off with a survey so I understand uh, who's listening and how we can uh, adjust this presentation to you guys. I'm going to talk about uh, GDPR, introduce uh, players, terms, and concepts and then dive into Tridian uh, DX features as part of the suite and specifically sites uh, for personalization, the ambient data framework, and audience manager. So let me start with the survey and Kate will help me with this. So the first question, what is your primary role in terms of GDPR and SDL Tridian uh, DX, which is sites or docs products? And Kate, how does is uh, this feature is new to me in Bright Talk? The powered hit? line. Okay. I'll give you about a minute to answer these. This helps me um, gauge the audience and adjust how technical we go and what to focus on. Okay, we got a couple of responses. Okay, should we go to the next one? Yep, I'm just on the next question. Okay. And should I give a summary as we go or at the end? Uh, it looks like we have, oh, go ahead. I said I'll do it at the end. So how far along are you in terms of GDPR at your organization or in any of your current projects? From no plans to researching to projects in progress, one or more, or maybe you've completed your first or all of your GDPR compliance projects.
Okay. Let's go on to the last question. And what can I focus on? What are you most interested? Um, GDPR terms and concepts, the, the trading features, trading sites features that are impacted by GDPR, perhaps you're on the doc side, or specific recommendations for the ambient data framework and experience optimization, or perhaps audience manager. Again, the poll is live. Okay. And Kate, does, uh, does everyone see the, the results or should I share them or summarize what I see? Um, could you summarize them, please? Okay. So in terms of role, the majority of you, 60% are technical, consultant or developer. We also have some project sponsors and project leads. 20, uh, split between 20 and 20 percent. So I'll, I'll keep it a little bit uh, technical, but I'll, I'll try to introduce things uh, up front as we get into them. In terms of projects, the majority of you are uh, do have GDPR compliance projects in progress, which is great. Um, some uh, don't have plans, so uh, this, this information may be useful as other customers are uh, get interested in kicking off their projects. So you have some background and context to talk about GDPR and privacy practices and our software. And what are you most interested in learning? So there's a little bit in GDPR terms and concepts. So that tells me we have 14%. So that tells me that you may have heard of it already or you've done your own research. So I can skip a little bit faster through some of the concepts. You're most interested at 71% uh, SDL trading sites features impacted by GDPR. Um, no responses for, for docs and some recommendations for the ambient data framework and experience optimization. So for audience manager, no responses, but I can show you some screens in audience manager that offer some good uh, privacy practices that you might want to implement in your own uh, solutions. Okay, so for those uh, already have projects in place, you know that the effective deadline is May 25th of uh, this year. GDPR is about stronger um, privacy protections and giving rights to people um, over their data, um, to delete it, to control processing, um, to, to get it and know how their personal data is being used. There's also, in addition to technology, um, the GDPR enforces um, uh, data controllers to provide a legal basis or reasons and documentation and processes around how they're processing such data. Okay. GDPR is meant to protect privacy, increase transparency, and it's not meant to block data. It's meant to improve data portability, so giving uh, data subjects rights and controls over how they use their data and um, moving it uh, around. The impact. Um, when I first looked at GDPR with, uh, and, and catching up with our data privacy, uh, Andrew, um, it seemed like GDPR was limited to uh, uh, data subject people in Europe, customers serving them. But the, the latest talk and discussions uh, online, uh, it seems this is, this is, it goes beyond that, that GDPR can apply to people visiting uh, the European Union uh, member states um, or even organizations in Europe 
serving people outside of uh, Europe's boundaries. So I think in practice, especially for Trinity Insights customers who often have a global footprint, uh, this can, you can almost think of this as applying to, to everybody, especially for large multinational organizations or any organization that has a, a presence um, beyond a specific country. The impact to, to you as implementers, um, there will be projects. Uh, there will be questions about it within your own organization. Um, as, uh, as users, uh, you get more uh, rights. And then there's work for uh, vendors and data processors to um, prove their compliance with the GDPR. So this information may be useful for you and your organization. Maybe you'll lead projects. Um, it's early days, but GDPR seems similar to things like topics like accessibility semantic web search engine optimization, where I expect there will be um, new people, subject matter experts, uh, kind of rising to the occasion to meet these kind of non-functional requirements. And in the end, it's about protecting privacy. Okay, So I've seen this with, with other um, requirements, where you start with information, getting guidance, prioritizing the work, joining a community, and eventually improving the practice. Sounds like most of you are already on, on projects, so let, let's uh, go into the concepts and then move on to the Trudy Insights features. Terms and concepts. Data controller, data processor, data subprocessor, subject, and su supervisory authority. Um, in this context, the data controller is typically the our customers, so people with the Trudy Insights implementation because they're working with the personal data of their visitors. The visitors to the sites would be the data subject, the one who, ha who has personal data that might be processed by the data controller. Your data, um, uh, data processor and subprocessors would be your uh, third-party solutions, uh, your CRM. It could be us, SDL, if you're hosting with us. Um, and um, so processors would be the processors that those processors use. The supervisory authority is the appointed um, organization within each EU member state that handles and deals with uh, GDPR, including uh, getting uh, complaints, responding to them, and giving guidance. In terms of terms, in terms of terms, uh, we have personal data, special data, and there's also another class of data in the US we refer to sensitive data. It's not specific to the GDPR, but if you're working across uh, multiple regions, it might make sense to just handle sensitive data, which includes social security number, driver's license number, medical records, financial information, um, along with special data together. Now, the GDPR specifically mentions what counts as special data uh, listed here, including race, uh, ethnic origin, political opinion, uh, philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, biometric data used to identify people, sex life or sexual orientation, and criminal convictions. But personal data, there are some examples in GDPR, um, but it's anything that can be used to identify a natural person. Um, this includes uh, IP addresses, uh, other identifiers, and some things, for example, where you live, may not be personally identifiable information or personal data, but if you put enough information together, you can create a profile and reasonably be able to identify a person. So GDPR is, is vague on this um, because technology is improving and it's getting easier and easier to identify uh, people with separate pieces of data. The data subject rights. I'm going to assume that uh, you have kind of a fami familiarity with some of these, so I'll go through these pretty quickly uh, to get to the sites and get any feedback or questions from, from the, you guys as my audience. I figure I'd start with a, with a cartoon. This is, uh, there is an interesting blog called gdprtunes.com. Um, if you want to maybe make some posters or, or, or break the ice on some of the subjects, uh, data subject rights, lawfulness of processing. 
The point here is that you need a legal basis in order to process uh, personal data. On the web and in most of the scenarios, opt-in will be your most uh, uh, frequent or, or used uh, legal basis for processing data. But you might have use cases where you use legitimate interests where the data is part of a contract, so you don't necessarily need to secure permission to, to use that data. Um, or the, the data might uh, be important to public interest or you need it for legal compliance. So we have different flavors of this legal basis or lawfulness of processing. Notice um, what's, uh, what I suspect customers need to revisit is uh, making sure that data processing is clear to their customers. Children, um, uh, consent is 16 years and above. Uh, where you would need to see, uh, if it's below 16, you need to seek uh, a permission from a parent or guardian. And some member states might reduce this to 13. In the US, I believe a comparable law, um, COPA, is 13 and up. Your data subjects, your website visitors, or your customers' prospects have the right to withdraw their consent. They have a right to object to uh, data, certain data processing. Uh, they have a right to get access to that data, where you provide the details and you also explain the rights of what you're processing, how, how it's shared, the retention period you have for it. Data subjects have a right to rectification, meaning um, to fix or adjust something that's inaccurate. A right to be a forgotten, um, where uh, they ask, do you have, they can ask, do you have any data on them? And then you're uh, obliged to delete it unless you have a legitimate interest to keep it. For example, if you have a, a legal case regarding the data or, or um, another reason uh, to keep it. Um, right to notification. So uh, as a data subject, when you exercise your right to please uh, delete something or to change something, uh, the data controller, which would be you if, you're, if you own uh, this, you're controlling this data, you should let the data subject know that you've informed other uh, recipients of the data, your third parties. And sometimes you cannot delete data. You might leave it, need it for a legal claim. Um, and that would be where you would restrict processing. Uh, an example use case of this is say you are a user of a website, say on Facebook or something, and you wanted to stop uh, processing. You didn't want to show up in search results. Uh, you wanted to kind of deactivate your profile. Uh, this would be a scenario where you're asking to restrict processing of your personal information, but not necessarily delete everything. So it's kind of a on hold suspension of, of an account or, or a person that you know about as an organization. And that animation was not intentional. That, was, that animation was, used for, was for this one. The right to data portability. Um, this is where the GDPR reminds me of, of HIPAA. Under HIPAA, it's a US law governing um, health information. Uh, you're allowed to ask for your data so that you can provide it to someone else. Under GDPR, you can do that. You can request your personal data uh, for yourself in a human machine readable format or to be sent to another data controller. Ah, there's my animation. Data from uh, the data controller to another data controller. Okay. Under the data subject right, notification of data breach. Um, if you have discovered a data breach, you must uh, notify uh, an, an authority, as well as um, the customers whose data has been breached. If, however, um, the, that data is rendered um, impossible to read, for example, through, through encryption, you don't necessarily have to um, announce such a breach. So this is an interesting carrot under uh, GDPR. 
covering how you protect data. En encryption is highly recommended. Um, some concepts, you probably have seen these on privacy uh, by design, is where you want to minimize data, um, make it hard to understand or identify people by pseudonymizing. Uh, you want to be transparent, have clear um, data retention policies, delete data when it's no longer needed, and if possible, give your customers self-service over their data. Okay, so let's get into the personalization features. I'm going to slow down a little bit, and uh, if you have questions, feel free to, to add them um, to the feedback or questions, and we can explore those as we go along. Okay. Technically, you can use anything in Tritium Sites to deal with personal data. For example, if you published profile uh, information or biographies uh, of your customer just as, as content, um, you can publish that with Tritium Sites. We have some features that are specifically related, related to context, to visitors, for example, experience optimization. Uh, that is our personalization, formerly called Smart Target um, feature. Ambient Data Framework is the ability to understand your visitor um, either through information that you have in your databases or ambient data. Um, that is information detected by their request or in their request. The context cartridge is, is a feature that lets you optimize your website responses based on um, known details about the visitor's uh, device, device type, OS, screen size, and other context related to their device. Audience Manager is our contact management um, uh, feature. We ha we'll have, this year we'll be releasing CRM accelerators and connectors uh, where we'll be putting some uh, GDPR uh, friendly opt-in features into those. You might use user generated contact to get feedback from customers. Blueprinting, um, to, most customers use blueprinting to change content to a specific locale or language. But if you store or work with that language, that could be considered personal data. We have a contextual templating feature that lets you change uh, the responsive content uh, based on things from the ambient data framework. And uh, the content delivery APIs with taxonomy and metadata let you do uh, even a lot more to dynamically change your site based on whatever your requirements are. Um, I'd like to call out Nuno's blog post. Uh, how would you do it without Tridian? So a lot of times you will create um, things like personalization uh, with other uh, products, services, or it might be specific to your implementation. So GDPR is, is technology agnostic. You might be using our software, you might be using something else, but uh, keep the use cases in mind. Okay. So let me give, um, talk about impact for, for each of these. When using experience optimization, you'll want to have your disclaimers and opt-ins up front before you start promoting content. Um, you also want to make sure your CMS users that are working with the system and your implementers uh, when you're setting up your claims and triggers, which I'll show uh, in a little bit, um, keep privacy in mind. For the ambient data framework, this is the framework that lets you manage the information known about the user. So on its own, it's, it's not, um, we don't do anything with personal data. It, it depends on your implementation. And the recommendation here is to limit what you're putting in the ADF and how you're using it and how you process it. The context cartridge, it's, this is an anonymous approach at mobile, um, uh, improving the mobile experience, device-based experience for a website. In most cases, I would say you're fine, but if you're trying to store, use, or abuse the context cartridge, um, you can get in trouble with GDPR. Uh, for example, uh, you might recognize the type of, of device a user has. And if you're making legal decisions or decisions that have a strong impact on uh, the visitor, maybe on a, a loan or prices or other scenarios like that, um, 
that's where you're, you're starting, you can start, uh, ab start to abuse uh, the point of this specific feature, which is more about device optimization. For audience manager, uh, you want to be explicit with permissions and anytime you're dealing with, with uh, contacts. Self-service is great. Offer profile management, which we have an example for audience manager. And use features like opt-in, export, delete, custom fields, and the do not mail feature in audience manager to control how you interact with uh, your contacts. CRM accelerators and connectors. This is similar to audience manager recommendations. Um, if you use something like uh, Salesforce, you'll also want to um, employ something s similar where you have visitor preference management on the site controlling um, what you do with your visitors' personal data, and you get the opt-ins up front uh, from visitors. User-generated content. Um, one point to know here with uh, user comments is they can be anonymous or they can be connected to audience manager or third-party system. If you're doing anonymous uh, commenting, we do have a cookie that lets you recognize a visitor in case they want to interact with their comments. But anonymous uh, comments after the fact, where someone has left a comment, but then you have no way to identify them, you should be clear up front that it is impossible for you to delete contacts or comments if you can't identify the user. And blueprinting, uh, blueprinting itself isn't uh, necessarily private data, but if you store or recognize um, and somehow keep uh, the user's language preference, um, that with other data could, could be considered personal data. So you'll want to be transparent about that. Um, when, when your visitors visit, revisit or come back to your site. So let's talk a little bit about experience optimization. So as a technical implementer, you know that uh, to set up uh, for this kind of personalization, you need to implement a claim, trigger, and footprint. The claim is just something your web application knows about the visitor. When they come in, uh, you can recognize something uh, from their uh, request to your site. The trigger is a condition on when that claim matches something, you should promote some, some content. And the footprint is a feature in experience optimization that lets your backend CMS users change the site to see how it uh, uh, adjusts and responds to different kinds of scenarios. So let me get you some visuals for experience optimization. In this example, I have an example page with a banner and what's, uh, what we can call a personalization region. This is an experience optimization or XO region. And in this region, it can have some default content. But if the user is from, say, San Diego with a certain income that you recognize, you can promote uh, a set of content to show up in this region. It happens dynamically when the visitor visits the page and your response created on the server return back to uh, the visitor. So under GDPR, you'll need to have a legal basis on processing this kind of data. So you might know where the visitor is based on IP address. You might know income um, based on either their behavior or information you have about them if they've logged in. The cleanest and easiest way would be to get explicit permission to offer content based on certain uh, attributes you know about the, about the customer. The opt-in must be uh, unselected by default and, sh and needs to happen before you start promoting uh, this kind of personalized content. You may be able to claim legitimate interests. I, I think this is kind of tricky. In the blogs I've looked at, and I think um, Research Andrew has, ha has seen, there are some Organizations claiming that, yeah, as a I have a legitimate interest to offer location-based offers because, you know, we're, we're a travel company. Um, I think you can, I think most important is you should be transparent. Uh, limit what data you use. For example, on GeoIP Lookup, you don't need the full IP address. You can, you can take off the last couple numbers and still resolve to um, a reasonable location. 
And if you have a strong case, be sure you, you document the process and, and have your legal basis uh, properly defined uh, so that if, the, if you ever get into uh, an audit, um, you have a proper reason for why you're personalizing in, in a certain way. Um, I think how this works will uh, be proven um, in implementations and over time um, as GDPR comes into effect. I think it's, it's maybe it's still early days, but I've, I've heard both sides saying, uh, yeah, you, you can uh, completely claim legitimate interest if you're personalizing on, on certain attributes, but I'd still be careful. Uh, I go back to the way I view it is, is don't be creepy, and if you're claiming legitimate interest, there's a balancing um, process you, you should do to compare what you're claiming versus what the, the customer or visitor would expect. Um, in your implementation, the ADF doesn't necessarily need URL parameters or email addresses, but uh, whatever you do, don't. Um, it, it's good to to limit uh, their use. That way, they don't show up in in server logs, or or uh, could be uh, abused. Do encrypt. Use uh, HTTPS for your site and between your microservices in your content delivery setup. So I mentioned I'm going to talk about uh, claims, triggers, and footprints. So here's some examples with experience optimization. So a claim could be things like location, income level, referral. Your trigger could be are the values that should match those specific claims. And this tells experience optimization to push certain content when those uh, claims are met, when they're triggered. And the footprint feature lets your backend CMS users preview. So with the footprint feature, you can test out some of these scenarios, that if the uh, location was Amsterdam and the income level was medium and was referred by LinkedIn, how should the site respond? So this is where you can test out some of your personalization scenarios. Uh, my recommendations here are to, to limit what claims uh, you're using to what's needed. So if you don't necessarily need all the data coming from Salesforce, if you have an integration example with them, um, don't, don't put it into the ADF or however you're managing uh, these kinds of, of data and claims. Um, when you're implementing triggers, you should probably have a process to uh, review how you're personalizing and when you're adding things uh, to an implementation. And of course, use the footprint to review. So on the technical side, cartridges sets and adjusts these claims. Claim is just anything the web application may know about you, your IP address, uh, which might uh, resolve to a location if you're using geo IP lookup. You might know your name or email depending on um, how you're putting these into the ADF. Each cartridge is just a configuration and jars, and you may have one or more of these cartridges uh, that run in a certain order and the claims are set when a visitor session or ADF session starts, and on each request you can, you can adjust it. So knowing what we know about GDPR and the ADF, how do you meet the use case? As a user, I want explicit and granular control over how my personal data is processed in order to protect my privacy. So I, I talked to a few of our uh, implementers in the community, um, and we came up with kind of these two approaches. One is if you're using ADF or experience optimization for the first time, consolidate your details into fewer cartridges. Audience Manager d does this with a preference uh, cartridge or Audience Manager cartridge. You could do something similar where you put all the claims related to uh, personal data processing into one piece of code into one cartridge, so essentially manage. If you can't do that, or you have an existing personalization ADF implementation, instead you might uh, choose to add a new value for the claims. And this would be by naming convention. Where you can say um, if, if a claim has the value not tracked, or a certain number, or a certain date, um, that, that can mean uh, that the contact does not want to be personalized in these scenarios. You would then need to use some logic 
in uh, your web application on how to respond to these claims. Okay. So the trade-off with a single preference cartridge is it's one place of code. It's clear. You can, sh you can look at that code. If there's any question or if you have an audit and they ask how you're personalizing it, you can go here. Here's our preference cartridges. These are all the things that um, we set uh, for the user. By default, they're turned off unless the user has explicitly opted in. So I think it's a nice, clean approach um, that you can, you can pick up and, and implement, especially if you're new to the ADF. The on-the-fly on the claim adjustments by naming convention idea, I think this might work if you have an existing implementation and you need to quickly revisit it to change a couple of things. Um, it, may, it may be harder to track down all the claims that relate to personal data, but uh, this could be a viable approach as well. Okay. Audience manager and GDPR. Um, I didn't I see any audience manager users here. So let's look at this as an example of things you might have or things you might consider, um, but not. Uh, but maybe you're not using audience manager. Maybe you're using Salesforce or some other CRM or some other scenarios or your own custom database uh, managing uh, such data. So audience manager has a content manager and content uh, delivery piece where information is synced between the two. And you can use the context to personalize or send out emails to. Okay, so let's keep the privacy by, by design concepts in mind, minimizing data, pseudonymization, transparency, data retention, self-service, and the subject rights. And let's look at uh, some audience manager screens. So, for outbound email and subscription status, um, users can register themselves, or visitors can register themselves as a contact, and then have a double opt-in and subscribe over, over email. They can also be active or not active. So if they're not active, you can't um, uh, send emails to them. So this can help you comply if a user asks, please stop processing my personal data. At least for audience manager, you can deactivate them. By default, email is sent to opted in contacts and no emails are sent to unsubscribed contacts. But you might have a scenario where you may, even though someone has not uh, subscribed, you, may still, you might um, uh, email them for certain scenarios. For example, to, to uh, request uh, opt in and their permission if you're doing a GDPR project for the, uh, starting it off for the first time. One example I saw online about uh, personalized marketing, one thing you might do is actually personalize an email um, and test it against different audiences to see how you can, um, to see what, what's the best way for you to get opt-in for, for GDPR from your, from your customers. So there's a difference between personalization, the technology, and personalization and data processing at a functional level. In Audience Manager, we have the ability to uh, add custom columns and um, change their sizes. This could be useful if you have something more granular. So if you have more than just an email use case and you have some personalization scenarios, you can add custom fields here to help you manage uh, what the, uh, the contact has opted into. You might use Audience Manager also to, to put in some evidence that the user has opted into something with some text. Um, but I'm not sure yet. It depends on implementations. Um, the important thing is that you do record uh, this kind of processing, that you have um, information and you can prove that certain contacts have opted in. Whether you do that in Audience Manager or in another system, you know, that, that kind of depends on your implementation and how many other systems touch uh, customer information. So that's uh, here on the left side is uh, the custom contact fields scenario uh, I mentioned. So here, um, perhaps you put in a field for uh, data um, uh, data deletion or data restriction or as a request. So maybe you have a contact form where the contact says, well, you know what, please delete me. 
Under GDPR, you should uh, delete it promptly, but it doesn't have to be immediate. Um, maybe later you can have a, a batch job or process that, that reviews all the things that have been requested to be deleted or all the contacts that have been requested to be deleted and then deletes them you know, that, that night or the next day. Um, in terms of data minimization, you can limit how visible these fields are. So for example, you might collect phone numbers through Audience Manager, but you don't want to show them to the CMS users. So you have that option to hide it from the CMS users, but you can still have that uh, information uh, available to the right people in your organization. For um, the right to get your, your, your information, um, you can export an individual contact, and that gives you a CSV file of the details of this contact. Um, but that's, a, that's at least for audience manager. Um, be aware that, that when a data subject asks for their information, it's across all of your systems uh, that you have. Um, also, the search option and fields are based on the, the column designer. So Audience Manager has some of these, these features already uh, to limit uh, data use and to restrict how uh, data is uh, processed, to disable accounts, um, and to help you store information about the, the contact with the custom fields. And here's that telephone example I mentioned. So the telephone uh, field here, it is in the Audience Manager database, but it's hidden from the UI. So if you actually go to the, the user interface for individual contact, uh, here's uh, my pseudonym, Livlong, a telephone actually doesn't show up uh, in the list. OK, so that's it for the features. If you have any questions or if I've triggered um, any thoughts, feel free to put things um, in uh, the, the chat features in BrightTalk, or feedback, sorry, feedback or questions. Data protection impact assessment. Um, this is a, a process and some paperwork you have to do if you're doing large scale data processing. Um, I don't see this as a typical use case for most of our customers, but if you perhaps needed to or wanted to monitor, set up cameras, monitor um, real, uh, real life activity, or you're broadly monitoring uh, internet activity, this is where you would do a data protection impact assessment. For your records, um, you want to uh, include your own details, purpose of processing, and kind of fully explain uh, why and how you're processing personal data. And it's similar for a, a, a data processor. So for example, we're already having customers asking us how are we dealing with IP addresses, for example. We're, we're discussing and, and uh, making adjustments as needed um, so that we can help um, our customers, who typically are uh, data controllers, comply with GDPR. And um, with any project, there's people, process, and technology. In terms of process, you want to consider um, security, um, minimizing data use, uh, secure backups, secure deletions, um, certifications, codes of conduct, conduct. For example, SDL has its own uh, privacy training, and I'd like to say I, I passed the last one. Hopefully Andrew's proud of me for that. Um, so those are things you want to do beyond the technology. So in this presentation, I'm, I'm focusing on our software features and technology, but of course GDPR is more than just the technical bit. Okay. Uh, privacy by design, a uh, nice, great recommendation. Um, and also, uh, as, a, as a practice to follow, you can also look towards your local data protection authorities. So each EU member state has an authority uh, website with a lot of guidance and an interpretation and explanations. For example, one of the good things to, to recognize is the, uh, the ICO for the UK. Uh, they've mentioned that although there are, are hefty fines, um, they're not planning to, to use the stick as much as guidance and, and uh, discussions uh, with 
uh, data controllers. So uh, there are there are legal ramifications and and fines, but there are also uh, authorities to help guide uh, um, data controllers on how to comply. Okay, so. I think it sounds like a lot of you are at step three, prioritizing the work, uh, joining the community. I thank you so much for attending. And um, one of the things I love about Tridian Sites and what uh, really got me involved with Tridian is this active guiding community. So I'd love to hear um, from you in the related links. I think uh, I have some uh, some of my blog posts posted. It's called the SDL Tridian DX GDPR blog post series. I love to hear your comments. Or hear your own examples and how you're tackling GDPR in the context of Tridian Sites or Tridian Docs, which we'll be working with more and more closely. Um, and then you guys can be quote unquote thought leaders and improve the practice for, for privacy. Okay. Questions. Thanks, Andrew and Alvin, for presenting. Um, we're now going to do the questions and answers. Um, if you do have a question, please put it in the questions box, and we'll be sure to answer it. I can, maybe I can tell Andrew that uh, I've been so thorough, there are no questions whatsoever in my presentation. I noticed this, yes, indeed. Some of the, um, let me go through some of the things I've, I've questions I've had, um, and maybe on the technical side, you guys can, can uh, uh, think about this one. Um, so, does it apply everywhere? And it's uh, the, this came up at TDS India, where I was talking to the audience, and it's it's yes, it's practically uh, everywhere. So it's for uh, citizens or residents or even guests of uh, member states in the European Union. So it definitely has a, a global impact. Yeah, just picking up on that, uh, Alvin, uh, the, the the legal sort of approach is that if you're a global company and you are selling products or services into Europe, then you are caught by GDPR if you process personal data of European citizens. And I think the best example I always think of is the, the Harley Davidson uh, guy in uh, the middle of the Midwest in, in America. If he is uh, a salesman, you know, selling Harley Davidson parts, and he has a website, and he just sells in US dollars, uh, has his website just in American, just selling to American citizens, and that's all he expects, then if somebody chooses to buy something from him, from Europe, then he's not caught by GDPR. But if he was the same man sitting in the same place in America, but his website was multinational, which of course SDL would help him arrange, then he's selling, uh, he has his website in different languages, and he's able to deal in euros as well as US dollars, and able to deal in pounds then GDPR would say that he is selling products and services into Europe, and hence he has to comply with GDPR when processing European uh, personal data. So I think the best thing to say is always to look at GDPR as a global benchmark. Uh, you can't go wrong if you have that standard yeah. so far as you're dealing with Europeans. You may you may be providing some people outside of Europe with slightly more rights than they have in their local country, but that may be the, the lesser risk than not complying with GDPR. So, so I hope that helps. Definitely. Okay, I think that wraps it up. I'll try to give you guys uh, and girls five minutes back, four minutes back. Uh, and again, from my view, it's about not being creepy, being transparent, clear with how you're processing uh, data, and getting the opt-in um, permission to process data up front. 
uh, not defaulted to, to yes or hidden behind a giant terms and conditions. It needs to be granular. And, and hopefully you can see in this presentation that, that we can help you enable that. Great. Thanks, Alvin. Um, and thanks, everyone, for attending our webinar. Um, as Alvin said, there is a GDPR blog series, so we've attached that into the attachments and links section, so you can actually um, go to the link from there. Um, we hope you found today's session useful, and we look forward to seeing you again on one of our next webinars. Have a great rest of day. Thank you.